it's interesting that we've sort of danced around Feuerbach himself, Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, we really only talked about him in the first video on the chief defect of materialism, but this document is called the Theses on Feuerbach. So at this point, we're going to revisit a point that Marx alluded to only very briefly in the first sentence, where he mentions Feuerbach specifically. And we took a look at a couple of Feuerbach's ideas particularly paying attention to the way that Feuerbach conceives of the human being and looking at how that differs from the way Marx conceives of the human being. And we glossed a little bit over Feuerbach's conception of something he calls a human essence or a human nature. That's going to be gone into a little bit more detail here at this point. It may not be clear exactly what significance Feuerbach held for Karl Marx. Why call this the thesis on Feuerbach? Why not the thesis on Hegel or someone else? Why Feuerbach? In other words, why does Marx single out Feuerbach for criticism? The reason Ludwig Feuerbach was so significant for Marx, as well as for other German philosophers at that time, who were interested in reworking the Hegelian system, is precisely because of the way in which Feuerbach managed to do that. Feuerbach took Hegel's idealist philosophy and inverted it, or as Marx put it, Feuerbach turned Hegel on his head. The best way to get a grasp of what exactly that entails is to take a look at specific ideas that Hegel had and examine how Feuerbach reworked them into an apparently materialist philosophy rather than an idealist one. Take, for example, the absolute idea, which we looked at in the last video, Hegel's absolute idea, this one single unifying idea of which all other ideas are expressions or instantations of, and which at the end, will, the end of history, will eventually culminate and unify as this one single absolute idea. All these conflicts that ideas have with each other over time will resolve into unity in the form of this absolute idea. Feuerbach writes something very interesting in the preface to the second edition of The Essence of Christianity about what the idea means to him. And Feuerbach writes, Briefly, the idea to me is only faith in the historical future, in the triumph of truth and virtue. It has for me only a political and moral significance. I attach myself in direct opposition to Hegel, only to realism. So Feuerbach likes this aspect of Hegel's philosophical system where there is an end that we are proceeding towards, but he doesn't like that it's an, an idea at the end, that it's not something real in his view. What Feuerbach does is he takes this idea, it's no longer a capital I idea anymore, it's now a lowercase i, it's something that we can wrap our heads around. The idea that Feuerbach is interested in working towards is simply a vision of the future, an aspiration for a better tomorrow, uh, a better way of structuring society, um, a way of Ultimately, what Feuerbach is advocating for is a kind of humanism, where we just look at the inherent value of human beings and just build society off of that, rather than try and acquiesce to whatever we think the, the momentary whim of Geist happens to be. Which brings us to the way in which Feuerbach restructured the Geist of Hegel's philosophy. Now, the Geist spirit or mind, as we saw last time in Hegel's system, in his understanding of history in particular, serves the role of what Marx calls the active side of reality. The Geist solves the problem of subjectless reality, which is entailed by materialism, because Geist is that subject. It is acting upon or through the world. As a materialist and an apparent atheist, Feuerbach would come to reject the notion that something spiritual or mental is acting through the world. At least that's what he says. Put a pin in that for now, we'll come back to that later. 
Feuerbach wants to keep the logic of Hegel's philosophy. He wants to keep the logic of its history, whereby something is driving things forward. But he rejects idealism, so he rejects that that thing driving everything forward is something mental or spiritual. So he keeps the role that the Geist serves. He keeps some kind of subject, some kind of logical process by which things are happening. However, he replaces Geist with something else, with something that he calls a human nature or a human essence. So just as the idea is no longer a capital I idea, the logic of Hegel's history for Feuerbach is no longer a capital L logic. It's a lowercase l logic. It's something imminent to us. It is us, or is it? Because are we the same thing as our nature? Or are those two different things? And if they are two different things, what kind of thing is each? What is a human being and what is a human nature? And we're about to stumble upon the problem that Marx eventually stumbled upon as well in Feuerbach's philosophy. And that is quite simply that Feuerbach fails to completely go uh, the materialist route. He fails to completely posit something that is fully material because a human nature or human essence is just as abstract from the human being itself as Hegel's Geist, as his spirit or mind. And we talked about that in the first video, but that was also before we understood fully what Marx means by the active side, what exactly he's looking for. And so now it's about to become hopefully a little bit more clear uh, exactly where Feuerbach messes up in Marx's view and why it matters so much. When Marx says that Feuerbach wants sensuous objects really distinct from thought objects, what he's saying is that Feuerbach wants to do a materialist philosophy. He wants to sketch reality as solely made of matter. He wants to escape uh, the, the trappings of abstract idealism as, uh, as the Hegelian system uh, would entail, and which is untenable for Marx and for other materials philosophers of that time who were particularly interested in applying their philosophy in the political sphere, that is practically, that is directly affecting the way society is structured, changing things. This is what Marx means by, by practical activity, praxis, um, as it's often referred to. Feuerbach wants that, but Marx says that he doesn't go all the way. For Marx, this human nature, human essence, is a thought object. It is not sensuous. It is not something material. It's not something that we can touch. What Feuerbach says, and I showed that in the, like I've said in the first video, um, this human essence instantiates itself in human beings and expresses itself through our activity. But that's the same thing that Hegel's Geist does. And so for Feuerbach, they're too similar, they're too abstract. Feuerbach's human essence is just as abstract for Marx as Hegel's Geist, so it's untenable, it's not very useful to him. Upon coming to this conclusion that Feuerbach did not succeed in completely reworking the Hegelian system, in completely bringing Hegel's idealism down to the material, um, a conclusion that Marx did not reach totally on his own. This had already been, um, the criticism of Feuerbach had already been lodged by Max Stirner, and Max Stirner uh, was sort of, sort of the one that pushed Marx to give up on, on Feuerbach's philosophy. When this happened, and again, Marx was not the only one, uh, this was a huge disappointment for Marx and for other German philosophers as well in that, uh, uh, that time. The Feuerbach was at one time thought to be the heir to the, germ to the throne of German philosophy. He was widely considered to be the next Hegel. 
albeit a materialist version of Hegel. His Essence of Christianity, his magnum opus in 1841, when that was published, Frederick Engels, Marx's writing partner, said, we all became Feuerbachians. When that book came out, everyone became Feuerbachians, everyone meaning the, the young Hegelians, the leftist materialist philosophers, uh, of which Marx and Engels were, mem were members uh, at one time. By the time Feuerbach died, he was penniless, or virtually penniless. Uh, he had published volumes of work, all of which have been critically panned pretty much since the publication of The Essence of Christianity. It's very interesting to think about how um, when you're doing philosophy, you can set out with a particular goal in mind and not reach it and not realize that you haven't reached it until someone else comes in and critiques it. It's very interesting to see someone like Feuerbach, someone who is well established in uh, in the philosophical scene at that time, someone who had who commanded respect. Um, to see someone like that set out to do something really major, really revolutionary uh, in philosophy, and then and see everyone sort of group around him, and then ultimately cast him aside. Uh, is is very interesting to, to think about just how difficult it is to do philosophy. There is no philosopher who is not without their critics. There is no philosophy without its flaws. And um, this is a great reminder of that. And it, it's a humbling thing to reflect on. Um, some humility is very important to have when working with uh, philosophical ideas. Finally, I've included the way in which Feuerbach understood the notion of God. Of course, it's important not to confuse God with Hegel's Geist. That's why I've included them separately. But the notion of God that Feuerbach had in mind also was certainly not unique to Hegel. It's a very general notion of God that any of us would be familiar with whether or not we believe in God. That notion of God, Feuerbach says is just that, a notion. It is a thought object, an object onto which we project our own values, our own qualities, and our own capacities. Theology, Feuerbach said, is just backwards anthropology, or inverted anthropology. What he means by that is that whenever we're talking about God, religion, spirituality, we're really talking about ourselves. For, and I, I explained this in the first video a little bit more about how exactly that process works, about how we slip up. We end up, uh, we have some awareness of our own innate capacity to do certain things, about our own values about things, our own qualities. And for some reason, we project those onto some anthropomorphized deity, something spiritual. God. So Feuerbach says there is no God, really. There's just the thought of God. And what we need to do is we need to stop calling this God and start recognizing that that's us. Um, we are God, in a way. This is not too dissimilar from the way, uh, the way in which Plato advocated for becoming like God. That was a central part of Plato's philosophy, uh, the highest activity that human beings could uh, participate in was contemplation, and Feuerbach loves contemplation, and he also was very familiar with ancient Greek philosophy. In fact, the last work, I believe it was the last work he wrote before he died, was about ancient Greek philosophy. The reason I included this is not so much because Marx commented on this directly, which he really doesn't, but because I think this, if you're having trouble understanding exactly what Feuerbach is doing here, when he takes Hegel's absolute idea and converts it into an aspiration for a better historical future, when he takes Hegel's spirit or mind and converts it into some essential nature of human beings. Um, that can be very confusing because it's very abstract. Um, the notion of God, again, whether you believe in God or not, is a fairly familiar notion. And so Feuerbach is taking that notion and converting it into something that is, I think, pretty accessible, pretty easy to understand. That is the central thesis of the essence of Christianity. So 
I included this because I think it's interesting to think about, first of all, and second of all, I think if you're having trouble understanding what he's doing with Hegel's ideas, because Hegel's ideas are probably very unfamiliar to most people, um, I thought it would be helpful to include a, a probably more familiar notion that Feuerbach reworks into uh, something humanistic, something somewhat materialistic. So if you can understand what he's doing here with, with converting God into a thought object, then you've got the skeleton key for everything he does with Hegel's ideas.